Today we're looking at Sword of Doom from 1966. It is directed by Kiachi Okamoto and stars Tatsuya Nakadai as a merciless samurai who is unknowingly stalked by the consequences of his past violent actions. So this is your first time with the Sword of Doom? Yeah, and um, I should I should flag up that I'm I'm going to bring probably very very little to this conversation because I don't generally tend to watch Japanese martial arts samurai movies at all. They're yeah, just completely that's why I thought it would be nice to push you out of your comfort zone a little bit. Yeah. Bring an extra flavour to the podcast. So yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, not not so much for the content as for the style. Yeah, sure. Which I thought was fantastic. It's beautiful, so, isn't it? Yeah, it's one of those ones where it's going to make me seek out what I possibly can by the same director. Yeah, yeah. You must have read the director was forced to do this film after... Yeah, his previous film was a bit of a flop and they, they didn't like it at all. Yeah, some, one of the producers said it was ten years ahead of his time, but they released it the next year. It was a film called Epoch of Murder Madness in mm. the States. I'm sure the Japanese title the Japanese title. A bit better. Yeah, it was The Age of Assassins. Yeah. And the, the writer, Shinobi Hashimoto... Yeah, what a great career. Yeah, what an amazing career. It's like <laughs> most of Kurosawa's movies and also um, Kobayashi collaborations too. <laughs> I've got Harry Kiri downstairs, but still haven't watched it. Yeah, I really want to see that. It's like been on my list for years. Yeah. They also worked together on a movie called Samurai Assassin, which isn't a kind of prequel to this, but it's kind of about, you know, the title card that comes up at the beginning that says the, the Sakurada Gate incident, yeah. which actually isn't something that's featured in the first act of the film. It's more of a timestamp. Mm. And his film Samurai Assassin deals with that incident in great detail which was a political assassination there's another film which uh, shinobi hashimoto wrote called samurai rebellion which i've seen which i really like as well mm. which is kind of i've got that earmarked somewhere down the line once okay. you've kind of got over your uh, initial samurai experience well it's more sort of for for what okamoto brings to the story than than the story itself and the, and the writing it's just one of those films that makes you realize how ahead of their time and and how ahead of even present day filmmaking some old films are you just want to take this and say right see that that's interesting <laughs> yeah, yeah. do something like that you know if you're going if you're going to compose a, a conversation do something like that yeah it's lovely Don't... just tracks in and out on characters isn't it and yeah. as they pause for thought you sort of move in and out of their headspace and mm. yeah it's really nice great yeah. technique yeah. and you see you see the way these scenes are built every every camera move and every edit is pre-planned yeah, yeah. it works beautifully it's mm. just like you can shoot coverage and mids wide and close up and just cut it together and, uh, yeah, yeah just yeah. have a look at this there's uh, a thought i think it was on one of the notes on the um, criterion that because the film deals with a samurai who has precise form that the filmmaker also showed that, you know, he, they forced him to make this film, but he showed that he still has mm. the form and the technique and, you know, he's still a master, basically, yeah. even though he's shackled to a studio. So, I mean, you've seen a few Kurosawas, I guess? It's Not really. I've never been able to get into the um, period Kurosawas. Oh, yeah, okay. I really like um, the present day stuff. You know, oh, I like okay. um, Ikiru and um, Stray Dog. Yeah, yeah. And high and low, uh, but the period films just I've I've tried you know I tried Red Beard and it was a long time ago. Maybe now I'd appreciate the technique more, sure, but sure. it's just the barrier for me was complete disinterest in in the subject matter. Yeah, okay. What was it about this one that made you sort of see past that? Uh, it was just so beautifully made. Yeah. Um, it's one of those things where if you've got antenna for them, then you'll just notice amazing kind of creative camera moves and and. Mm and cutting and stuff like that stuff like that stuff like that <laughs> what do you think about Tatsuya Nakadai's performance I was kind of um, anticipating your response because I don't know if you're going to like I was hoping you'd be like an Alan Delon comparison just reminds me so much of that sort of cool European detached slightly, slightly sociopathic removed <laughs> yeah yeah like uh, Drive as well, Ryan Gosling in Drive. And who was it in The Driver as well? Is this the oh, American Ryan archetype for that? Ryan O'Neill in The yeah. Driver. I, I found it a lot more palatable in, in a Japanese movie. Mm -hmm. um, I found it more interesting. And it was he was kind of like a, a glacial removed character, but it was mm. quite a feverish, staring, Yeah, there's definitely moments nuance, isn't there? Wasn't there? Well, yeah, at that point where he kills um, the guy in the tournament, there's a moment just after that where you see this some guilt on his face you know mm. which we don't often see with him but like a remorse or, or a regret that he'd made that action especially i think after he said to his father that maybe he'd let this guy go i just i just find his physicality is a bit more interesting than you kind of european men to remove did you think there was anyone outstanding i mean obviously apart from 
Toshiro Mifune. Yeah, Toshiro Mifune, yeah. It's a sort of nice supporting role, isn't it? Mm. And I'm sure you know that it was intended as the first part of a trilogy. I wondered why that... Because that, it kind of seems to be setting up the possibility of a duel between them, but then that's never resolved. And yeah, I thought that was it. just a playful bit of... Like, a little bit of mischief. Yeah, a lot of the um, stuff I've read about the film says that it can be read either way, that, you know, you can take it as the first part of something that was never completed, or if you take it as a self-contained narrative, that what it means when the film ends after this great battle ends mid-battle, mm. but there's still all these people waiting in line to battle him next, like yeah. his uh, his curse is eternal, like you know, evil itself will never die, and he's kind of cursed to be forever battling. The novel is called The Great Bodhisattva Pass, which is the great pass of Buddha. Mm. Um, and I think the, f- the film is supposed to be a meditation on Buddhism, or the, the novel certainly is, and I think this has elements of that in it. You know, it starts with him killing a Buddhist pilgrim mercilessly, Although it was odd it, that he was kind of granting that pilgrim's wish. He was actually praying to die yeah. at that point. Yeah, that's it. So maybe the great Buddha does grant the wishes. In but also... mysterious ways. There was an interview recently with Tatsuya Nakadai after a screening of The Sword of Doom where he said that uh, Ryonosuke's swordsmanship was a skill that was passed down through reincarnation. That's why he's so good. That's why it's kind of inherent in his spirit, this skill, and also maybe the the curse as well, that karmically he's reincarnated because of a uh, crime in a previous life. Okay. I mean, I, I can read that into it, but I do like the way that the fact... I mean, it's called Sword of Doom, and you, uh, you kind of expect a bit more blatant mysticism, mm-hmm. especially around the sword, but it, there's, there doesn't seem to be any of that actually in the film itself. There's, there's, t- uh, there's tiny bits inferred. I think there's stuff like... Um, it, he heals remarkably well and seems to be able to absorb rather a large amount of sake without it, you know, putting him on on his back. I don't know if he's immortal, but, you know, definitely supernatural. In the books, he's blinded and carries on as a kind of blind swordsman with this uh, supernatural gift. Of... Would that be an, an influence on Zatoichi? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I don't know when Zatoichi was written, but these books, it's like 40-odd volumes, isn't it? started in 1913, mm. and he just kept adding, <laughs> the novelist just kept adding and adding more chapters to it. Far East Enders. <laughs> yeah. And each chapter ended on a cliffhanger, and apparently the last chapter ends with him blinded uh, on a rooftop of a house in a flood and just disappearing <laughs> down the river in, in the midst of a flood. That's kind of the last chapter of the book, I think. Was it written conclusively that way, or did the author simply die at that point? He, he just died. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. okay. So do you know if the... Because the film's structured in three chapters, which have very kind of um, chapter-heading titles. Do you know if those are specific chapters of the serial, or are they just... Um... No, so those are real-life incidents. The Sakurada Gate incident is a real-life uh, assassination attempt. There's the Shakashita incident, which was another assassination attempt, 19, uh, 1862. And then the last one is the Shinsen group is formed. Yeah, that's it. And this is all to do with, like, this period of time, you know, it's 1868, if you imagine, like, in England, that's... Industrial know, Revolution. Yeah, that's it, yeah. you know, cause, because the film is samurais in you know, what look like tiny little villages. It feels timeless, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's actually, Edo is Tokyo, and Kyoto is still Kyoto. That's the only, my sort of, if I had to pick fault with the film, it's that the cities don't have the scale that you would expect, mm. given the, the point in time where, where we're actually at. And it's quite jarring as well, because, you know, how timeless these films feel, they could be set any time in you know, over 300 years. Mm-mm. It's quite jarring when one of them pulls a revolver yeah, towards that's the it. end. It's like, oh, oh, we are really in the late 19th century. Yeah, that's it. Well, I think that at this point, was it 1854 when the Americans had turned up in Japan and kind of forced them to open their borders to trade under threat of uh, destruction otherwise, like mm. gunboat diplomacy. One of the first gifts they brought were guns. <laughs> So I think that's where, you know, you start to be able to mark Western influence. Yeah. And the last one is 1863, the Shinsen group is formed. And they were uh, a group of samurai police officers that patrolled Kyoto under power of the shogunate and caused hell. Are they actually policing or are they just kind of like gangstering? A bit of both, I think, mm. yeah. Should we, should we go into it? Hmm. So we open, first section opens spring 1860, the Sakurada Gate incident. It, uh, it opens 
kind of quite up on hillsides with open landscapes and these are pretty much the only open air fresh air shots in the entire film mm -hmm. um, and Amatsu and her grandfather are, are traveling and the grandfather says it's all quite quite tellingly says it's all downhill from here yeah, sure. they say it twice in the scene they're buddhist pilgrims aren't they just yeah. going from temple to temple and, and shrine to shrine yeah, yeah paying their respects to the to the buddha and when Amatsu goes to get water, um, grandfather is praying, to kind of to re to release him from being a burden to his granddaughter. Yeah, that's it. So she can be free from the pilgrimage, the constant pilgrimage, and make something of her life. Mm. And then Ryunosuke, our antagonist, anti-hero. Anti-hero, yeah. Because you, you do kind of warm to him for all of his kind of brutality, right? In a way. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, this, this is going to be... a a repeated it's just going to be an endless refrain it's this is one of these ones like cold war we talked about it where mm. you just get every single thing is great and you just end up flagging every single thing yeah, in every yeah. scene congratulating the filmmakers yeah we can kind of skip through it, i guess there's beautiful compositions and editing in this in this and there's there's a great shot in this where we're being introduced to Rionosuke and um he's wearing one of those huge sort of conical samurai yeah, hats wicker looking wicker with with big holes in between there's a perfectly framed shot where you can see his eyes through two holes in the wicker mm -hmm. and then lifts up to reveal his face yeah there's something about where he kills the uh the pilgrim something about buddha granting the pilgrim's wish but also something about Rionosuke just kind of i don't know defying buddha maybe it feels like to kill a pilgrim so cold-heartedly mm. it's as if he's daring karma to catch up with him yeah i mean that's very much his character in this first act i mean following this there's some very very concise exposition from different characters mm -hmm. talking to each other and which set him up as something like of a, a, of a spoiled brat yeah. who's kind of testing the boundaries constantly and mm -hmm. is, is pushing his luck all yeah the his time. dad says to him you know i'm i'm scared of you doesn't mm -hmm. he at some point but there's there's uh, again it's it's beautiful little touches that you you almost subliminally notice like um I don't know if there's different shutter speeds used on, on some shots where it gives it that kind of jerky, hyper-real thing, mm -hmm. but they're for very, very short cuts, just for little tiny fragments of scenes, which gives give things a little hyper-real kick. Oh, good, man. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I was worried you'd be uh, just, like, livid and... <laughs> no, this is... this is. I've picked up a few kind of key... What are apparently key modern... modern. Well, when I say modern, I'm talking about the 60s, really. Mm -hmm. 60s Japanese films... Um, with a view to catching up on some of this stuff. About this time last year, I watched the the ghost story um, Kuroneko, I think it's pronounced. Mm -hmm. But it's it's just really beautifully, interestingly made. And each time I see one of these, I make a mental note to, to get another one off the shelf and oh, watch okay. it quite soon. Have you watched any Suzuki? Um, no. Is he branded to kill? Yeah, I think so. I've seen... Just see, you know when you see, like, really sort of strong references for Tarantino from Japan generally yeah. it tends to be Suzuki is he branded to kill in Tokyo Drifter yeah that's it yeah the thing is I'm, I'm wary of that stuff I no, I've never watching, seen any of it. it it seems like the camp side of it mm -hmm. like the camp sort of pop art kind of side of it whereas I like a more serious take on things <laughs> as long as it's interestingly made sure I've got uh, Ryan Suzuki heading home to his father who tells him to throw the match I was surprised, even the second time round watching this, I was surprised that I did kind of sympathise with him. I didn't think it's fair within such an honour-based system to expect people to throw a match like that, to expect a samurai to throw a fight mm -hmm. for the sake of somebody else's honour. I, I, I was thinking at the time, it do, doesn't work that way really, does it? You can't really expect him to do that. I don't know, maybe you know, sacrifice is a part of the, uh, the honourable code, isn't it? Mm. We have Hama's visit. Hama is the wife of his opponent, yes. um, who visits him and tries to persuade him to throw the fight as well. Yeah, and he ends up. Um, it's a beautiful tracking shot in this conversation where we're quite wide, and then we just track in and then back out again. It's mm. really nice. And um, the the conversation continues in is it a mill house, a water mill? Yeah, that's it on the uh, on the land. Because mm. his father has a fencing school, plenty of land, lots of students. You know, quite respected. And there's um, it's the first time I noticed really nice, careful use of sound in this. Mm -hmm. There's uh, the sound of the mill wheel pumping and, and yeah, grinding and thumping. Grinding really, and thumping. It's really nice, isn't it? Brought up, but then um, when you cut, you know, within the same scene, you cut to a different angle from slightly further away. It they do actually carefully mix the sound mm -hmm. down so that it, so that it's right in the background, which is not you know a level of care I'd expect from a, a mid '60s movie. Mm -hmm. And then he kind of coerces Hammer into into 
having sex with him in order to, to throw the fight. He does promise to throw the fight, and when the tournament happens, we, we see that he doesn't attack. He waits and, yeah. you know, accepts the draw. He's relieved when a draw is issued. Mm. And then we have the tournament itself. Yeah, it? it's a really nice sequence here where it's lovely. You, you can talk about the flashbacks. I love that, where you see the character and the camera just tracks into them and then you get a little momentary flashback to fill in what's happened in the uh, few hours between the last scene and the scene that we're in. Mm. And they do it with uh, Ryanosuke and with his opponent, Bunujo, where, you, where we see him at home with his wife. Divorcing his wife. <laughs> yeah, exactly, because he knows where she, that she's been out and she was supposed to she's, go. She's dishonoured him. Uh, yeah, that's it. So, yeah, yeah uh, I think for me, watching the film, that was the point where I was like, man, I love the technique in this film. That, oh, okay. that flashback... You know how nice it was to move into the next scene and then just to step back again yeah. and then just to fill in a little blank so that we know when those two characters are face to face that there's some real uh, there's a real grudge there now. I'd already I'd already been sucked in by all the the conversation with Hama. Yeah. Okay. But then for the actual tournament itself, it's like, yep, I'm on for this. Yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> it's just the build up, uh, the long, slow, silent build up. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, really, it's it's just so disciplined. Yeah, you're talking about when they actually stand up to fight. Yeah, yeah, and they just move this kind of slow, focused dance around each other, don't they? Mm. And I love all the uh, characters in the audience that kind of sit forwards and watch. And one of them says, "You know, this this isn't a tournament; it's a duel." Mm. It's really nice, nice stuff. And it's over in a flash. It's just a single move, isn't That's it? That's it, yeah. I love that as well, that his technique is so fast that even the judge doesn't see it. <laughs> and I think we get a nice kind of bookend with that, that the judge doesn't see it. Mm. But later on, when we meet Toshiro Mifune's character, Shimada, he is able to read Ronosuke's technique. He says, he beat you with the uh, whatever the, the name of the thrust is. Mm. And he's like, I want to fight him again. He's like, <laughs> no, you're done. There's a really nice bit, um, again, it's, I'm going to be flagging up tiny little fragments, <laughs> yeah. but there's there's a really nice bit at, at the very end of the tournament. Um, there's there's two really nice, just two moving camera shots catching people's reactions. Mm-hmm. There's um, Hami's reaction, and I didn't make a note, it went so quickly, and, and somebody else's reaction as as he's leaving um, and heading off to the, yeah, to the yeah, first. Yeah, there's just tracking on the forest. The, you see them through the crowd. Mm. Yeah, it's really nice. I think that old boy that's there in the kind of sort of... Uh, crazy hair and makeup I think he's supposed to be the master isn't he of the the two former students oh okay yeah and then we're into uh, there's three big fights in the movie and this is fight number one Um, I notice each of the fights has an interesting environmental effect to give it a bit more colour oh yeah okay Uh, this one's set in the forest and there's a a fog creeps in yeah Yeah. it's really nice isn't it Um, and we get snow later on don't we and the the third one's one's, uh, fire and smoke yeah. yeah You're, you're the martial arts fan. <laughs> yeah, I think this, you know, it's one of those, it's a master class, isn't it? Just to simply set the camera, tracking, follow the actor, cut everybody up, mm. and then you come into this nice sort of over-the-shoulder close-up that creeps around as we see his, his, kind of his expression. Joyful, post-orgasmic yeah, yeah, expression. Yeah, kind of. It's, it's, but he's also a bit stunned, isn't he, as well, you know? Oh, he's got, he's got a look at like this sort of delicious smile and a fever, <laughs> feverish cast to his eyes. I mean, you can just see he's just he's just had his greatest pleasure in life. Yeah, that's it. And I guess we're into the second chapter now. That's um, spring 1862, the Sakashita incident. Yeah, I think the novel fills out a lot more detail between these two points. But mm. I read that the um, a Japanese audience were probably very familiar with the book and all the film versions. I think there'd been three trilogies of adaptations by this point already to the uninitiated i mean watching this i was really really pleased and surprised with with i guess how how casual it was about about time passing mm-hmm. you know you you infer that time has passed simply by you know it'll give you a key shot of of, of autumn leaves or something or and then it'll be snowing and you realize okay some months have passed sure. but without any explicit explanation mm-hmm. and the beginning of this chapter has a really nice well really nice opening shot of kind of this shabby house and and unkempt garden yeah, yeah. and you just know from that straight away you're in reduced circumstances yeah that's it it's fallen on hard times you know you don't often see the consequence of a brutal massacre but he's obviously brought shame on his father and been cast out of the the village and you know forced on his way and picked up his opponent's wife as extra mm. extra baggage for the uh, next chapter of his life 
Yeah. I thought I thought this scene um, overplayed. I mean, I guess you have to kind of cram the exposition into a short scene. Yeah. But it does kind of overplay his hard luck a little bit. You know, he's drinking, his wife is giving him grief. Yeah. Um, he's not charging enough for his murder, is he? Yeah, exactly. He's, <laughs> he's doing... Um, low paid low paid murders low paid assassinations yeah interesting detail here uh, the they I'm assuming it's their baby son yeah um what an elaborate haircut the child yeah, it's had. cute isn't he it's weird yeah but i mean unless japanese children are far better behaved it must just be a nightmare to 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 do those elaborate shapes and stuff well i guess it's growing the hair ready for those kind of samurai ponytails and buns and all of that sort of stuff is it supposed to represent maybe your position in the class system to make yeah. you like a rank easily but identifiable the, the, the little squares in the side by the ear and at the back mm-hmm. and you just think well, it just must be a nightmare to maintain <laughs> with a small child yeah it looks super cute though yeah and then ohama threatens to kill the baby yeah just this idea that she wants to put everybody puts the, put them out of their misery like kill the baby kill herself and just be done with mm. this awful situation that she finds herself in I'm confused a little as to why she's with him. Yeah, I don't know. You'd think she had somewhere better to go, like back to her mother or, you know, somebody else that could have... I wonder if that look in the crowd was, was a look of, I don't know, is she attracted to him? It's, uh, it seems odd. It seems one of those strange... There, there is a sort of uh, moment in that flashback sequence to the mill where she looks at him differently. You know, she's not afraid. There's just a, a sort of quizzical look on her face. So maybe mm. that's... Meant to infer some kind of interest, interest or obligation, even. Mm, it's an odd one. Yeah, because she warns him of the attack in the forest as well, and he says, "You know, why are you warning me?" And she's like, "I want, you, I want to come with you." Mm. And I think even he's conf- <laughs> confused about. It. But maybe this goes back to the idea of karma again, you know, and this idea that you know you have to take responsibility for your actions otherwise you're destined to repeat the same mistakes and he takes responsibility for her because of the seduction and execution of her husband yeah yeah the next thing is the introduction of shimada played by toshiro mifuni who has another fencing school just down the road and i think ryanosuke says that he heard somebody making an attack that he's interested in sparring against and so he just moseys into the uh, fencing school mm. asks for a bout gets one defeats his opponent yeah and i guess as we were saying before there's um mifuni's appearance here kind of sets up anticipation of of some sort of duel between them at the climax of the film but that that never comes yeah well he's i mean he's a great presence straight mm. away on, on camera he just looks so commanding i think yeah there's, it definitely whets your appetite for seeing these two characters face off and they they tease it later on at the uh the, the big showdown in the snow just while we're talking about ryan Suke and shimada being face to face i got a note from um stuart galbraith the fourth wrote a book called the emperor and the wolf about um kurosawa and mifuni and there's a little there's a couple of pages on this film where okamoto says that uh nakadai who played um Rinosuke was from a theatrical background so could laugh and joke in between takes and then switch into character <laughs> but uh, Mifuni what, didn't have any theatrical training at all and was just right. a movie star so he just had to lock into it <laughs> so he stayed in character all the time <laughs> and he said it, it made him really tense to work with there's the murder on the boat and then there's a scene again back at Rinosuke's house yeah it's such a nice moment this where maybe their lives could go in a different direction well it, it opens with another of those post-murder bliss mm-hmm. but he, he kind of comes down from it and then there's kind of like a, a melancholy sharing of memories isn't there between him yeah that's it and they, they talk about traveling back home to the daibotsu pass they talk about seeing family and just making a big change to their lives and then he remembers that hyoma Utsugi is still out there the brother of the man he killed at the tournament and that's something that plagues him yeah, and he's thinking back to his childhood and his life with his father, isn't he? Mm-hmm. Melancholy about that. Yeah, he doesn't know if his father's still alive. Mm. There's, um, I was listening to the commentary on the Criterion disc of this, and it, it 
does skip a lot of scenes it just kind of focuses on on the scenes based around the lead but it was you know great technical dissection i found but i found it a bit annoying because it's pointing out things that i wanted to write down that i'd noticed myself oh, yeah, okay it's like well i can't listen I've to this anymore because, that. Yeah, yeah. there's really nice use of composition throughout the film where when you when you want to bring characters together and, and have some warmth you you hold them in the frame you don't kind of cut away or separate them. Mm-hmm. cut between them you just hold them in the frame there's a bit much later on in the film, a uh, scene in Kyoto where Hiyama visits... Amatsu. Yeah, Amatsu and her uncle. Yeah, yeah, that's nice. Um, and there's like a real warmth between them and it often frames the three of them in the shot all yeah, the time. Yeah, that's it, trying even to keep them grouped together. Yeah, even when it's cutting between them, it's cutting from one three shot to another. Yeah, there's an- another nice sequence with Omatsu and, and uh, Uncle Shichebe. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Um, I just wrote uncle. Yeah, uncle. I just used uncle for the rest of my notes. That's the first time I wrote his name down. Who's the thief peddler that we saw right at the very beginning who adopts Amatsu and tries to keep her safe. Mm. Where he's at the... um, He's deposited her with a flower. What is she? Is she like a... Is it a euphemism? Is she like a a prostitute? No, I think she's a flower sculptress, but she has... She was the mistress of the previous lord. And she's just kind of a, a, a worldly woman, isn't she now? Yeah, yeah she, she, she seems to she be has a lover. Rather, oh, she, is she married? Who's the, who's the the man yeah. who comes back from gambling all night? Is he a lover or is yeah, he? Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, he sort of just turns up. But there's a nice sequence where we see uh, Uncle and Omatsu in her parlour, mm. um, and the camera frames them on the the right hand side of frame and just gently tracks away and then back into them as Omatsu's talking about her options for the future mm. it's just really nice that it keeps them kind of squeezed together yeah the next thing i have as as a note to discuss is um when omatsu's in the service of the lord who's been described as as a woman hating lord <laughs> yeah lord he's cameo de- yeah. his name is <laughs> derided by one of his enemies as as unable to make advances to a woman <laughs> yeah that's uh, it are we hinting at homosexuality here <laughs> yeah he seems to be uh quite quick to try and punish her when he's alone with her doesn't he mm. and using his sword to undress her and much the same way that Ryanosuke had done with uh, Omatsu. But it didn't the... seem it didn't seem like a sexual advance. It was just like he was just torturing her yeah, as you would like a, a, a small animal or something. Mm-mm. But yeah, you, I, I mean, I don't know to what degree is sadism is sadism is is because he hates women specifically or just because he's a sadist. And, but they do kind of make a point of flagging up his, yeah, yeah. his heterosexual inadequacies. <laughs> but he also seems a bit kind of amoral as well, doesn't he, with his political allegiances? You know, he mm. doesn't kind of make a pact with the uh, the the samurai that are there to visit him. Yeah, and it's interesting. We see Rinosuke and uh, Omatsu together. Yeah, which you know is it's quite right. Yeah, yeah, it's nice. Well, because you know, obviously, he killed her grandfather, and he's responsible for her being in this position. Their paths cross again later on. I just think it's it's a really nice kind of intersection, a nice uh, convergence mm. of the characters, and them not knowing who the other one is. Just jumping back to the bit with um, Umatsu being tortured, and uh, the lighting just went into style stylization overdrive. There, it turned into like really high contrast film noir, black and white. Yeah, big shadows. One of one of the first things I noticed watching the films uh, from the very beginning was how western the music was. And again, it's an, an annoying point that's also made on the commentary. Oh, really? It's about <laughs> about how western it was. But I noticed it before I listened to the commentary. <laughs> okay, good. Um, but yeah, some of it sounds, you know, like... It some of be... it sounds really electronic towards the end. Mm. Just before the final battle, mm. where he's losing his mind, there's a really nice kind of, like, it feels like pitch shifting. I'll have to listen back to that again. Mm. I just thought a lot of it sounded like martial or war music, and particularly a lot of film noir sounding stuff. Do you think that's anything to do with the fact that the Americans occupied Japan after the Second World War? Um, well, from... From my very light research on uh, on the director, he was a big fan of American movies. Yeah, he, okay. he got into making movies because he's a John Ford fan. Oh, okay. So I think he brought a lot of American influence to it. Yeah, right, right. They say that the American occupation from 45 to 53 mm. was an experiment in cultural influence as well. How much could they put their stamp on yeah. the new version of Japan? Well, you can certainly see that in things like Stray Dog, can't you? Mm. And there's some really nice. Um, I don't know, I'm just you know I'm just rhapsodising about camera moves here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the really nice fast-moving lateral camera moves at the very end after the the kind of torment's been interrupted by thieves. Yeah, yeah. 
and then you just people fleeing left and right and mm-hmm. the camera's kind of tracking along with them tracking along with uncle as well yeah he's there just he just says run doesn't he get <laughs> away from here i was wrong i like um, it that he keeps turning up uncle he's one of those characters on first viewing it felt like he was interrupting the the story but second third viewing i really like his presence there and i think i miss you know if there was a second and third chapter made mm. for the film i would have liked to have seen his story end you know yeah. he's quite a wily character isn't he you know de- making deals and stealing and he seems quite kind of hand to mouth and quite he's got quite a, an edgy life he, he becomes more likable as the film goes on as well because i was a little suspicious of him at, at first yeah, yeah there's kind a of few like gl- a s- exchanges of glances isn't there it's like yeah what are you thinking uncle <laughs> no he's he's well he's a thief but he's thoroughly honorable in, yeah he's in decent, the film isn't he yeah yeah, because he's like, I wish we could live together. <laughs> no, but then he does <laughs> kind of clarify, like, you know, I, I looked forward to retiring and holding her children on my knee. And so it's definitely a grandfatherly role, isn't it? Yeah, Fatherly, exactly. Grandfatherly. Yeah, yeah. I've got uh, another sort of time jump forward into autumn. It's established in a single shot with just kind of autumn leaves in the shot. Um, and you have Hyoma practicing his sword play. Yeah. Those wonderful little scenes. <laughs> yeah, it's really nice, isn't it? You know, he's kind of just thrusting the tip of his sword into the into beam of light. Beam of sunlight. Yeah, it's really nice stuff. But it's framed and choreographed perfectly so the blade mm. just catches, just kind of lands within this thin beam of light mm. in, in a close up. And there's details of his feet kind of gliding across the mm-hmm. floor. Yeah, it's lovely stuff, that. And then again, you kind of cut forward to winter and you're in a snowy scene. Yeah, this great assassination scene. It's, mm. it's a bit of a balls up, isn't it? The character, yeah. you know, the character that's here, there's Serizawa and um, there's another guy that we meet at the original tournament. Kondo? Is he the slightly heavier guy who's yeah, sitting in yeah. the back? Yeah, um, that's it. Comment, commentating on Yeah, that. that's it. So, yeah. you know, and in the end they betray each other and uh, Serizawa gets stabbed to death. But those are actual real characters from Japanese history and they, oh. they recur in lots of kind of Japanese culture. They're in manga and books and films and tv shows and okay. songs and yeah they're quite famous characters so now we're on to the, the second fight which for my money is the most spectacular one it's great it's, it's a bit <laughs> funny, isn't it he's yeah. so good i love the way he gets out of the um and he shows like the other the other side of swordsmanship you know you talk about like balance you know he's saying you know who are you state your intent you know do you want a duel uh, are you what is this is this a grudge like explain yourselves and mm. they're like oh we've made a terrible mistake and he's like who are you what was your purpose and apologize yeah and then they attack him and he <laughs> kills them all doesn't he but then he's really fr- fuming about it afterwards when he confronts yeah. the leader and he's like those were good swordsmen and you made me kill them all like how are you gonna <laughs> he says how are you gonna atone for this you fool <laughs> It's a lovely, lovely battle, though, isn't it? Yeah, it's not... It's. I mean, it's not so much the choreo- choreography of the fighting. It's just, you know, you've got multiple cameras capturing it from yeah, different yeah. angles. Um, I really like the stuff on the telephoto lens. Yeah, yeah. It's got that slightly grainy, distorted look. Yeah, yeah. And just the fact that it's taking place in snow just gives you that extra level of visual detail. Yeah, it's it just lovely. keeps your eye moving. But also you have the stuff with the characters. You have Ryanosuke just watching. Like, yeah. he doesn't pull his sword and he watches Shimada move. And, and you can see it. The realisation that I might not be the best man in the yeah, world with exactly. a sword. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. It's so much lovely stuff going on. I love seeing Ryanosuke's eyes through the snow as he just watches, transfixed. He's got enormous black eyes, hasn't <laughs> yeah, he? Yeah. Um, immediately following on from this, you have another scene with Ryanosuke back at his house, but this time, you know, he's, he's absolutely desolate and emptied out because he's still thinking yeah, it's the first time he's had a shock i think he's mm. actually seen someone with equal if not superior swordsmanship skills than him and i think that shook him to his core mm. at this point in the film it gets very very plotty for me mm. and I, I do have trouble keeping up yeah yeah i mean a few times i've seen it quite a few times so i i'm kind of up to speed yeah yeah i know where everybody is and, and why they're there and mm. you know i I get the idea that it's frustrating that there's so many threads to follow and half of them don't pay off at all. Yeah. They're just left very kind of open-ended. Things that are set up in conversations which you're supposed to hold in your mind mm-hmm. and weigh against other things that are set up in other conversations yeah, yeah. and then sudden surprise events which you don't realise how We they... should also add that at this point Ryan Suke is living under an alias. <laughs> <laughs> so that just makes it a little bit harder to keep track as well, doesn't it? Yeah. 
So I guess now we're into the, the last part of the movie, which is spring of 1863, the Shinsen group is formed. And again, you have like the political machinations going on here, which which add another level of complexity. Yeah. So I can give you, I found my note on the uh, Shinsen Gumi, which was a special police force organized by the Bakufu, which was the military government during Japan's Bakumutsu period, which is the late uh, Tokugawa shogunate. And was at, they were only active until 1869, and it was founded to protect the shogunate representatives in Kyoto. So they they kind of they follow that quite closely. I think you mm. know they're talking about putting themselves in a better position to protect the shogunate, but also cause hell. I think one of them says, "Yeah, we're going to have a right old time of it." Live above the law themselves. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Ryosuke has accepted the challenge from Hyoma to duel in the morning and Rinosuke commits to killing both brothers but when he tells Ohama she says she doesn't want him to kill another innocent person and so when he's asleep he's having a proper fever dream as well isn't he which yeah. is maybe something to do with seeing Shimada's skill and she tries to kill him obviously fails and he kind of pursues her outside and, and murders her yeah there's a sort of nice cat and mouse around it's not nice it's terrifying cat and mouse game around the uh, the land Ends it's, with them in a frozen, not frozen lake, but an icy ice, lake. Icy lake. Yeah. It's quite good, um, even though some of the kind of close-ups of feet do reveal that it's not snow, it's kind of white sand mm -hmm. on a studio set, but it does feel authentically chilly and mm. it does do the job, the art direction. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, should we talk about the art direction? Yeah, why not? It's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing that's missing, I think, is the scale of the cities, but um, apart from that, I love those kind of those sets where it's clearly a huge set that's been built on a soundstage to give them control over the shooting environment. Mm. But there's something about the artifice that, I don't know, makes it feel much more like a, a was, story being told. Well, I was taken in by it, to be honest. I didn't mm. realise that so much of it was, was big sets. Uh, Kyoto? Kyoto. It's got one of my favourite cuts in this. One of my favourite little bits of... of narrative conciseness is where you arrive at Kyoto, you see Uncle spotting Amatsu in the crowd, yep. and you cut there's no nonsense, you cut straight from that to a close up of Amatsu as she's just told the uncle that she's not going to leave the city. Mm -mm. And then you go see his reaction. It's like none of this, Oh, I haven't seen you for years, where have you yeah, been? Yeah, yeah. I have been looking at high and low for you mm. in this city. It's like straight into the conversation, then into the next scene where where Hyoma visits. Yeah and one thing I really love is when Hyomo turns up, the uh, the guy that says, oh, there's a samurai outside to see you. He says, you won't remember him. And as soon as he walks in, there's yeah, a moment where both of their faces up, yeah. lit up, light up. Yeah, it's so lovely. It's really genuine. Mm. So one of the frustrating things about the commentary is it skips all these scenes. It just says, right, now you can move ahead to chapter 13 where we're going to be talking oh, about it? this. And none of this kind of ancillary subplot stuff is discussed. Oh, that's frustrating. But there's a lot of really nice technique in this too. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, on second, third viewing, those characters, you know, going back to the sort of the, this idea of him being pursued by his his bad karma, mm. you know, you can see that it's like a wave that just keeps following him and following him and following him. And, mm. you know, the damage that he did to Amatsu, you know, she's kind of never far from him. She always finds herself in his orbit somehow. Yeah, yeah. She? And she's always Hiroma, kind of like, yeah. An uncle, you know, all mm. of the people that were affected by his seemingly, you know, thoughtless careless action that initial killing you know they're still there right at the end hot on his uh, mm. on his heels so the shinsen group have a have a party it's a beautiful tracking shot in this where uh, the party's in full full swing and one of the samurai stands up and the camera just tracks right to left as he staggers he's drunk staggers across <laughs> the hallway and then crouches down with ryan and he's like you have to teach me your method tell me how you fight like this mm. i really like that and this leads into a scene with Ryan Suke and Amatsu finally face to face. Yeah, that's it. There's a sort of little subplot with Serizawa wanting to uh, kill his rival, and at the same point, his rival wants to kill him, um, and all of that sort of plays out in the background of the final final fight. Final yeah. fight, yeah. yeah. But it's there's a really nice moment where. Uh, Ranosuke says that he will kill Omatsu for listening in on the conversation. He says that to Serizawa. But then when Serizawa leaves, he says, you know, you just wait till I've gone and then leave. Mm. So he's actually going to let her off. You know, it's like he's trying to do something good, swing his karma the other way. And I, I think referring back to the books, they say that his battle is constant where he's trying to do good things, but then ends up doing bad things. And that his life is a... Uh, 
a seesaw between the joy of the murder and the guilt at what he's the crimes he's committing. Mm. The wonderful scene with Ryan Suke and um, Umatsu both haunted by his apparitions, mm-hmm. apparitions of his, of the his ghosts, guilt, uh, yeah, that's ghosts it. of his past. They're starting to creep in into the mm. space, aren't they? Yeah. And maybe it's something to do with their connection, you know, going right back to the start of the film that enables her to see the stuff that's creeping into his subconscious, into his consciousness, this idea that he's haunted by his past deeds. Mm. I wonder if it's just a touch of explicit mysticism. I mean, I know obviously he's, he's haunted by it. And... Well, it's Buddhism, isn't it? It's the karma. You know, at some point he's going to have to face the res- responsibility for his actions. And what about, you know, the karma, the, the sort of Buddhist I, stuff I, underlying it? Did you I, kind of feel I, for that? I didn't really feel that so much in the movie. Um, I guess it's there as subtext, but I didn't really feel it much on screen. And I was quite, as I said before, I was quite surprised how how little it made of the sword of doom and and the you know potential mystical qualities of that. Yeah, there's a few throwaway lines in there. Mifuni says, you know, know the source, know the soul, you know the sword, or something yeah. like that. But if you if you are overplaying it, and if you wanted to emphasize that, you know, you might you know have a have a musical sting for when the sword is drawn, or you know, mm. it's some sort of portentous music oh, to yeah. suggest there's no close ups on the sword just the hilt at one point where we think is he going to draw down on mm. on Mifuni and he, he bottles it it's a really um, powerful scene it's a great use of sound design as well mm-hmm. with these specific sounds from each of his victims yeah yeah like the tinkling bell it's nice the, that we don't the, see the anybody you know we just hear some of the noises yeah the baby crying mm. the bell you do yeah. see some towards the end of the scene you do see some quite explicit shadows shadows you can see yeah these, sure who clearly is the shadow of the pilgrim and and I like this is another great bit of kind of art direction where where one kind of square room surrounded by a screen suddenly becomes this like labyrinth of corridors that he's yeah, wandering that's down. Yeah, hacking yeah. At. Apparently yeah. that's um, lifted almost entirely from the original 1934 adaptation okay. of the books, and every version since has remade that sequence, not shot for shot, but pretty close. Hmm. It's almost like it's obligatory. But apparently, there's apparently when Takashi Miyake remade Harry Kiri, yeah. he used the end of Sword of Doom as his reference instead of the end of Harry Kiri. Okay. <laughs> but I don't know which section, whether it's this bit <laughs> or the bit that comes after. So. Okay. so I guess we're finally at the end of the film. We're at the fight number three out of three. It's pretty yeah. spectacular, isn't it? It is. Yeah. It's it's quite low key. I love how bloody it is, and not like uh, the thrill of people getting chopped up, but just how much he's bleeding. Yeah. You know, the blood that's like pouring out of his legs, you know, from from being slashed and Mm. cut and stabbed. And I love the the blood going into his eyes. I I love how much pain he's in, basically. Mm. Talk about karma, you know, that's, uh, he's getting his just desserts there. But I noticed watching it a second time round that compared to the second fight, this this one starts off um, fairly restrained. It's kind of quite quite long, mid-wide shots. But then at the end of sections of that, you get these sudden flurries of extreme... Because a, the, a lot of the actual killings, obviously, that take place on camera mm-hmm. are quite bloodless. Yeah, yeah. And it's just kind of, you know, a concealed stab. Yeah. yeah. And then somebody falls. And the, the, the takes are quite long, doing a lot of that, and you, you feel that you're watching something fairly bloodless. But then you get this flurry of very quick shots of <laughs> blood-splattered faces yeah, yeah, and yeah. severed limbs. And Screams. Fingers coming Men off. Men in agony. And, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's really great. Um, and it gives you, you know, a sudden impression of how bloody it is that, mm-hmm. that you can't show in the wides. There's almost a touch of humour in the middle in one of the, the longest wides. Where they throw the pillows. Uh, I don't know, it wasn't that. It was for me where he took on four men at once and kind of stabbed them in quick succession and they take so long to fall down whilst oh, yeah, he's dealing they're... with other people. Yeah, you see that throughout the film, there's a couple of the stunt team, let's say, who kind of hit tiptoes and arched backs and they just hold their death position for as long as possible before <laughs> dropping down. Yeah, there's four of them, isn't there, in that final sequence where he's kind of cut them all down and then he turns to fight someone else and they all just kind of drop one, two, three, four. Mm. And yeah, that's really nice. Yeah, the thing that made me laugh is when they all throw the pillows at him. And then there's one guy that leaps forward and stabs him in the foot. <laughs> and he, like, slashes that guy about ten times as if to say, like, don't you dare stab me in the foot. It's so, such an insult. And then, yeah, the scene where they all throw pillows, like, really makes me laugh. And then the whole thing kind of gets gets more and more chaotic and you get this 
Also, he comes marching towards us. Well, that's he? it. You get the kind of tracking back as he comes marching towards mm-hmm. us, and there's a slight—I don't know if he's slightly blown up optically. Mm-hmm. Okay, I guess it's going to end in a freeze frame, so it will be an optical at this yeah, stage. Yeah, yeah. But it's got that slight graininess that gives it more intensity. Mm-hmm. And then you have that kind of the famous: you don't conclude the fight, you don't conclude the story, you just mm-hmm. freeze frame on him in in mid fight. Yeah, and it's the end. How did you feel about that? Because you know, I, I love it. I feel a little bit robbed at the same I time. But... I've, I've been so satisfied by what I've seen, and I know yeah, that yeah. he's going to win. And I know mm. that even if he wins, he might. Assuming this is a standalone piece. Yeah, yeah. If you think it's a continuation, you you know it could continue after that. Mm-hmm. So, but as a standalone, you know you know what's going to happen. It's just a, a yeah, brief, it. ambiguous ending. Yeah, yeah. Hyoma's waiting outside. So is Uncle. So is Shimada. You know, there's no escape from this. Plus, all those men that he's just killed probably have families as well. You mm. know, there's there's no escape from the consequences of your actions when you're that brutal. His whole life is going to be on the sword. Mm. So I think the Sword of Doom is like a nice entry point for samurai movies. If you're not somebody that you know watches too much Japanese cinema maybe this is a good why would this why would this be a good entry point is it is it typical or atypical of the well i think it's like as a standalone piece this you know I, I just find it like really exciting to watch you know it has the a really a nice kind of style to it it's really classy bit of filmmaking i, I wanted you to see it just because i was curious what what you think i know you have a slight aversion to samurais and you know no, I'm really glad. I'm really glad I watched it, and it has prompted me to. I say this happens like at least once a year. It's prompted me to go right. I need to watch more of these. I don't necessarily want to go and watch, you know, the Seven Samurai or Yojimbo sure, or anything sure, like sure. that. But I do want to dig out Harry Kiri. Yeah, and, yeah, definitely. And watch. I want to watch Onibaba again, which I haven't seen since I was about twenty. And yeah, I think I'd appreciate it on a whole new level now. I've kind of got earmarked for some point in the future Samurai Rebellion mm-hmm. um, which I think you'll like as well which has the same writer Shinobu Hashimoto and I definitely you know I definitely recommend this to anyone and if, if they were as close minded as me and said oh I don't like Samurai movies I'd explain to them exactly why I liked it so it's just an absolute feast for the eyes and ears yeah, and, yeah. And it's, a, it's a wonderful piece of craftsmanship isn't yeah, it yeah absolutely it's just beautifully made in, in every respect to the to the point where you know even though some of the subplots get a bit dense and overbearing towards the end there's still the craft just keeps you going <laughs> 